All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to yet another Zoom live session with Iverdent and Iverclaw Iverdent. This morning, we are lucky enough to have um, Dr. Corne Smith with us. Um, she'll be discussing the various um, technique options when doing indirect composite restorations. Um, thank you very much, Corne, and we really look forward to hearing to your presentation. Just before we get started, I just want to mention three things. Um, in order to see Corne's um, slides up on your screen, hover with your mouth towards the right hand corner of your screen, and then you'll see there's two options either speaker view or gallery view. If you are on speaker view, her slides will pop up on your full screen. Um, I just please also want all of you guys to keep your sound muted. Um, and if you are having any internet problems or connectivity problems, you're not hearing so nicely, you can always look at the option just to take off your video and maybe just put it on later if you wanna ask questions. If there are any questions, um, Kone is gonna go on with her presentation. You can always pop up the question in the chat box. Right at the end, um, I'll go through the questions and just see some of the questions she obviously answers during her presentation. Those that she didn't cover, I'll be asking her at the end. So we'll make sure that we do cover all of them. Those that there's not time off, at 60 minutes we cut off. Um, I'll get back to you with um, personal emails. Thank you very much. Bye, Danke Kourne. Hi, everyone. Um, please, can I have an indication? Um, do you guys hear me okay? If you can just write a message in your in your chat box if if the sound or the video of, of anything is unclear um every, everything okay okay cool perfect so welcome uh this is a new thing that we're trying to do and i i mean everyone's doing it so we're jumping on the bad bank in a little bit but it's it's really nice to be able to to just do dentistry a bit so it's it's nice to also find some value um, during our days and, and obviously we all love teeth. So um, welcome and thank you for joining us. Today we'll, we'll talk about direct and indirect direct composites and the way that I use it in my practice. So I want to specifically mention that I am not um, paid for this lecture and I don't get paid to talk about products. So um, this is really just my own experience and my opinion. And I'm no material expert. So if you guys have questions about the materials that I don't touch on today, um, Steph and I will also be able to help us out with that. Um, I want to especially welcome the guys from the Bridge Program. I know that there's a, a lot of our alumni that, that will be attending today and also the guys that are doing the Bridge Program this year. Thanks so much for joining us. And we're hoping to catch up with the Bridge Program delegates soon. So on that note, let's, let's get started. So composite buildups. What do we mean when we say composite buildups? For the purpose of this presentation, we are talking about direct and indirect composite buildups as part of the comprehensive treatment plan. So what that means is comprehensive looking at where patients more specifically. Um, I'm going to look at what works in my practice and what I think is practical for us to, to use. Uh, we'll look at the indication, we'll look at indirect, direct, and then what I see as the success that we can achieve. Firstly, the indication. The indication, in my opinion, is specifically in dental wear. So direct and, and indirect composites for the for the for, in context of today's lecture, we'll, we'll look at dental wear patients and more specifically younger patients, um, patients that can't always afford Emacs as a treatment option. And we'll also look at this treatment option um, for provisionals. So not really temps, but provisional restorations when we're doing phase treatment, treatment plans. So if we think of phase treatment plans, we're thinking of patients that are going through ortho, patients that we are also using um, provisional phases to open up the vertical. So that is specifically the indication that, that we are looking at at the moment. Uh, this is the patient that I want to bring to you guys' attention today. So the patient is uh, youngish, 30-ish. I think she's 32 when we took um, the initial photos. She presents, like you can see here on the, 
on the middle, top middle photo, she presents with a lot of, of wear. This patient has been a part of my practice for quite some time, and she has been treated with a bite plate for seven years. So she's been wearing that religiously, um, but she came to me and asked if there's, if there's anything else we can do. Um, she specifically complained about the sharp edges on her teeth and also food getting stuck in between her teeth. And in those little pits, she called them holes. We know it's not holes, but she, she was very annoyed with little pits and things getting stuck in those areas. And we have actually filled them up with a little bit of flowable resin over time, but they keep on coming out because she's actually just put them down. So on, on, on initial presentation, we looked at the, the way we did a full treatment um, workup for this patient. And in practice, we work in an interdisciplinary way. So we always combine orthodontics and periodontics as well. So we got our orthodontist um, to give her opinion on the case. Um, and we came up with a, a treatment plan that involved a little bit of ortho to open up the patient's vertical at the back. And we also needed space for our restorations. So without going into too much detail now of how that treatment process works, I mean, that's a couple of lectures on its own. Um, what you need to know here is that we wanted to create space for restorations. We didn't want to destroy any more tooth structure. If you look at this, these molars at the back, they've already been worn down so much. It would be such a shame if we go and we reduce and we drill away more tooth structure. In a young patient specifically, um, we want to preserve as much as possible. Also, we want to create a situation where we can bond to enamel. So the, the less we do, the better it would be. Um, I think it's very important in these cases that we have very clear communication with our patients. Um, when we initially started this process with the patient, like I said, there was a, already a trust relationship built up with her. And I didn't really need to convince her of any treatment that she needed. She came to me and she knew that she, something needed to be done. So we did the orthodontic treatment. Afterwards, uh, we did a re-evaluation and this was actually after her, her ortho. So at that point, we looked at different materials. Um, and the conversation was either Emacs or composite. And when I actually initially did this treatment um, plan workup for the patient, I didn't even know about an indirect composite that could be used for this. Um, but yes, when, when, we actually, when we actually did the, the treatment plan um, after the ortho, I did, uh, Steph Nye actually came to me and she showed me these little Tetricad blocks that were now available. Um, when I did my research, I found that this could be a really nice solution or a really nice alternative to using Emacs specifically in this case. So the conversation I had with the patient was that this would be a transitional or a phased treatment option. So we actually did all the, the back teeth. We built up all these back teeth. Remember, we created space for the restorations orthodontically. So I didn't have to reduce anything. I also didn't have to open up the vertical restoratively. I did that with orthodontics. So I did a wax up and I knew what the anatomy of these teeth needed to look like. And then we, we did the, the, the full case in, in Tetric CAD indirect composites. The patient was well aware that this is a new product and that we might still have to replace this with Emacs later on. I thought it was still a great option because if I have to replace one Emacs, of one of these Tetric CAD blocks with an Emacs, I've already got my vertical relationship established and I can do that one tooth at a time. So it was a much more affordable option for the patient. Plus it, it, the modulus of elasticity of this product allows for us to give it to a specifically a patient with wear. And um, I, I think we actually just bought time. So it's also a very repairable product. And as you guys can see here on the, on the bottom, it really blends in very well. And it's something that, that we just treated like a normal composite. So that's how my journey began with indirect composites. Um, at looking at that, I, I think this quote is very applicable. 
the best dentists make the patient worse at the slowest rate possible. And that's how I approach wear cases in my practice, especially on younger patients. We want to do as little as possible because it will get worse no matter what we do. Even if we restore, if we don't restore, things will get worse because people will still brux. If we change as much as we can and give them a, a fighting chance, I still think we need to be conservative. So looking at the research that's been done on how to treat wear cases, a lot of the research has been done around Emacs, but we can still use the same principles. So these are um, two articles that have been cited numerous times. The, the first one is from Frediani, and that, I just want to bring your attention to, to the principles here. They're talking about preserving as much of the already diminished tooth structure. They talk about maintaining vitality. They also talk about give, giving enough space for the restorations. Um, this is, was in 2012, and they actually said that, this, that it's unknown what, what the best material would be. Uh, a couple of years later, in 2019, Edelhoff published this, where he actually came to the conclusion that the way to treat these patients in wear cases is with Emacs. So that was the conclusion, and we take this as the golden standard. So how can we then apply these principles and look at different alternatives for younger patients, look at affordability, and look at a softer, gentler material and something that we can use in a transitional phase. So the non-negotiables are, we still need to be able to diagnose properly. We still need to know where the where, the where comes from. Then we need to approach this interdisciplinary. We can't just see everything from a restorative point and we need to plan properly. So these principles, you can't really um, take away, doesn't matter what materials you use. And then, of course, digital um, workflows makes, make, is making our lives a lot easier. And this, well, the indirect Tetri CAD block specifically is, is really nice for, for a digital workflow. Uh, more of the non-negotiables is preserve enamel. We want to preserve the vitality of the teeth. We want to create enough space. And then we also want to make sure we can use our bonding protocols, our adhesive dentistry bonding protocols. Now, I'm definitely not going to go into detail of how we prep and the uh, adhesive bonding dentistry. That's also another lecture on its own. But I, we can assume that we all understand adhesive bonding. So just to make it clear, Emacs is the golden standard. And this is what I use for most of my cases in my practice. I'm sure all of you listen to Mark's lecture. So we're not going to go into detail of why this is great. But composites can be a different alternative. And why do I think it is a great alternative? Because it's going to save me time in using the product, the, the material. So specifically on the TetriCAD block. So just to give you guys some insight as to how it actually works practically. If you use this little block instead of Emacs, it takes five minutes to mill instead of 15. It also is less, um, it, well, your burrs in your milling unit last a lot longer, 10 times longer, the science says. So you, you can actually save money. You don't have to put this in a furnace and you don't have to obviously stand and glaze. The, those are some of the main advantages. And then I also think that the cost of the block plays a role. So at the moment, or at that time, when I treated that patient, the cost of the TetriCAD blocks was half of the cost of Emacs. So it played a big role in the way that I would cost this treatment plan. So affordability plays a big role. If we're giving this as an alternative, it can't cost the same as Emacs. And Technique sensitivity is something that I just want to bring to your attention. If you are doing composite instead of um, porcelain, you can't think that it's just going <laughs> to, you're just going to get it right within the first or, or, or second or even the 10th case that you do. I think we, we're treating so in such dangerous territory sometimes when we, when we are proposing composite instead of porcelain or composite instead of lithium disilicate. Um, a lot of people are not doing these composites correctly. And I can put myself in that camp 
when I started doing composites as build-ups or composites building up loss to structure, my learning curve was massive. So that you have to spend time and you have to pay school fees when you start learning these techniques. You can't say that it is the same as doing a porcelain veneer. And that's really something that I, I want you guys to take home. Don't just think that this is an, a cheap alternative and it's a quick, a, a quick thing that you can um, just get, get used to. Know that it will have a learning curve and know that once you've paid your school fees in time and learning these techniques, then you can sell it as an as a alternative to your patients. Um, maintenance with these materials, with composite, is a lot easier because it's repairable. It's still a beautiful and aesthetic material, and it is really durable. So we're looking at 270 MPI um, for flexural strength. So let's just, we will compare that in more detail, but 270 is really strong. So we can actually rely on this material for its strength. So this is uh, just a little comparison that I, that I did for, for the, the different materials that we have available. Um, if we look at the, the different ones, looking at the left first, the silicate-based um, blocks that we have available. Impress is something that I've used extensively in my practice. I love this material. And it's at 185 uh, megapascal strength. Um, Vita is also in the same group of materials. Then Enamic is a hybrid ceramic. So that's a combination of ceramic and composite. The Tetricad block is only composite. And I think a lot of people get this wrong. They think it's a hybrid. It's not a hybrid. It is a composite that's been cured, heated, and compressed. So it's just a composite. It's the same Tetric uh, uh, composite you, that you all know. Then we have the glass reinforced ceramics and they, that's where Emacs falls in. And then obviously we have zirconia. So in the spectrum, this fits in right in the middle. And I truly believe that once we do more and more research on this product, there will be other implications as well. But yes, it's a very new product. Um, and we are in the beginning stages of seeing the, the actual implication. So yes, we've got a chair side and a lab alternative here. And this is what it looks like. So here you can see how I prep the teeth, virtually nothing. Um, these teeth were already worn down. I didn't have to do much to them. And we just smoothed the edges. And then the bonding protocol is quite specific where we actually try and do like a knit one, skip, skip one type of technique. And we are trying to limit our cleanup and our um, working off afterwards, which can be quite time consuming when you're doing composite buildups. And if we look at the result here, I think it's a very acceptable result, especially if we know that we can replace these later on with Emacs if the patient is, uh, gets a bit older. Uh, my workflow that I wanna go through um, is either lab, chair side, or digital or analog. I mean, those are the choices that we have. I, re I think that this is a great material if you have your own milling unit, but it's also equally great if you have a lab that can mill um, Tetric, that has a milling unit that, and you, they can just use the blocks. So in the case that I'm showing here, we, we did a full digital workflow. Um, we had um, the wax up done digitally, and then we planned the whole case digitally. Um, I used a scanner, to do the transfer. So in this specific case, I want to make it clear that this is, we still needed to do a wax up transfer because I milled it in my own, own milling unit. You can send it to the lab and then you don't have to do a wax up transfer because the wax up transfer can be done digitally. But it is important to know that that is an extra step that you need to do because you need to know what your anatomy needs to look like afterwards. So preparing the teeth and sealing the dentine um, that's the normal stuff that we all do. So uh, one of the questions that I got was, how do you temporize this? If you, if you don't do a one visit type of treatment, how do you temporize this? And something that I've just learned with trial and error is with these type of preparations, because I do immediate dentine sealing, I don't need temporaries. So it sounds quite harsh, but I actually don't need any temporaries. The patient goes home with an acrylic, not an acrylic, like a suck down vacuum, um, medium 
type of soft um, bite plate, which is almost like a, like a bleaching tray type of uh, material, but it's a bit thicker. And we just give them some fluoride, so, so, so something like tooth mousse to put in there to help with sensitivity, but it helps with any over eruption of the opposing arch, so they sleep with that. In, and if they have any sensitivity, they, they use that. But um, in my experience, patients don't really have sensitivity because we are sealing the dentine and we're not really preparing these teeth. So that's just a little tip on temporization. Um, but you don't want to send them with nothing because then you will get some over eruption of your opposing arch. You can also put the patient in a, in a, in a retainer on the top, so on the, of the opposing arch to prevent that. Um, and then, as I said, the milling time here is really, really short, which is a nice advantage. And then what do we do when we actually have the overlay? So when, once it's been milled and we get it back or we get it back from the lab, how, we, how do we treat the, the overlay? Um, it's important to, to get these steps right. Um, the, the research that's been done on the product say, says that sandblasting is one of the most important steps that you have to that you have to do so sandblasting with 50 or to 100 micron um, aluminium oxide at 1 to 1.5 bars of pressure so that's not a lot of pressure so please make sure when you have um, an aqua cutter if you have a sandblaster make sure that you don't put it on too high pressure it's a soft material you'll actually sandblast right through it i've done that a couple of times so make sure that it actually is set at the right pressure and that it's, and you have to, to follow this step. Um, afterwards, you can clean it with ethanol and then you use the um, universal, oh, the tetric N bond as a primer. So you use it as a bonding agent and as a primer on your actual restoration and you don't light cure it. So there's no itch, there's no hydrofluoric acid, um, acid, there's no phosphoric acid, there's nothing that goes onto the restoration. Just sandblasting and then your bonding agent without light curing it. On the tooth side, you follow the same protocol you would normally do, isolate, clean, itch, bond, and then you can follow different, there's a couple of different methods where you can do a net one, skip one type of approach, but it is imperative to use Teflon when you do these restoration, because remember, even your cement, everything you use is composite. Everything sticks to everything. So make sure that you get your, your flow, your workflow correct. So in this specific case, I did the seven and the six together. Um, and then, yes, the cement that we use is very link aesthetic. And I prefer using the light cure cement in these cases because as you can see here, um, they are so thin. So I'm very sure that my, my light will penetrate through the restoration. You can also use the dual cure cement. The reason that I use the light cure cement is mostly because it's easier to manage. Um, this is a tip that I got from Mark is to use these little brushes and not to just try and clean it up with a scaler or with an instrument. But we tack cure it. We keep it in place, which is a challenge with these ones because they are so, like the, it's such a non-retentive prep. So you have to keep it in place and you have to try and clean up as much of the cement as you possibly can because it sticks to everything and it becomes really difficult to get your contact points open and to, to separate the restorations afterwards. So clean it with the little brush and then use the, the light cure um, cement if it is at all possible. Um, I also use these strips quite often to get um, any excess out that might have gone through the, the contact points. Um, but yes, I, this is, that's been the, the biggest learning curve. And also I think one of the most important differences between injectable flowables on the posterior versus placing these indirect composites. Injectable flowables for me it has a lot more work cleaning up. This has been a lot more, a lot easier for me. Um, and it really doesn't take me as long as the, the direct injectable flowable technique. Polishing is a breeze with these, um, with these indirect um, composites and it is very, very easy to maintain. If the patient is a Braxa, and if you're treating wear patients, most likely they will be hard on their teeth. And if anything chips, you really just repair it with composite. So it's just a case of 
sandblasting it a little bit, exactly the same protocol, using your bonding agent, light curing it, and you can just repair it with composite. Easy as that. Remember, this is just a composite that's been heated and compressed. So very, very easy to maintain. So just some, some points that I wanted to just um, make clear here is, and now I see my, my slide, the text that I had on my slide is gone. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know how that happened. That's a bit of a glitch from my side. Um, I'll have to go through this now without, uh, without seeing it in front of me. Um, but I wanted to go through the advantages of, of this material. Remember, it's just a composite. It's been heated and it's been compressed, so it's stronger. That's the first thing. The second thing is it is actually just a, it's so much easier to mill these. So if you, have, if you have your own milling unit or if you want to send it to the lab with a milling unit, it's really nice because it's much, uh, uh, you can mill a lot more um, with, with these because your burrs are not going to take so much strain. Um, it's also much quicker milling and you don't have to put it in the furnace. Um, one of the other com um, advantages of this is, if you can see here on the screen, this is actually a class two that goes into proximally. It's really nice to, think, to know that if you use this as a, as a single unit, so for, if we just move away from the, the, the multi-units uh, and treating wear cases, if we just use this as an MO or as an MOD composite, it's so nice to know that it's cured in the box. So you don't have issues with curing um, in deep areas because the material's already been cured. So that's a very nice advantage um, as well. So just to summarize the advantages, as I said, and here you can actually see how it influences um, how the burrs of the milling units go into the block. It's, Emax is really tough on our burrs. And then another thing that's a massive advantage is because it's a, a composite, it mills very smoothly. So even though Emacs is great, we do know that we have a little bit of chipping on the edges. Um, but with the composite, with the Tetricad blocks, we don't have any, any chipping. So it's a very, very nice, smooth surface. Um, but again, there is a learning curve in the cementation technique. So don't think that you're just going to jump in and get it right immediately. Give yourself enough time when you start using this. Um, the direct technique that I wanted to quickly touch on um, is actually something that I started using quite long ago. Um, and it's, I, don't, I don't know if you guys have seen, there's a lot of these cases on Facebook where they do the injectable composites, especially on anterior teeth. Um, but it's a really nice technique if you want to be, if you actually want to play a little bit with composite um, and, and save your patient money. So the basics is that you have, you need a clear jig. So you still need to get like a, um, at least um, a wax up. So you're, you're, you still need a wax up, but you also need to make a clear jig of that, of that wax up that you're planning. So if you're going to open the vertical, you have to uh, um, make this jig before you start. So you still, you still need your lab involved or you can do this digitally. Um, I really like this product from GC. Um, it's a very, very clear material. There's a lot of them on the market, but this one specifically is really um, drawn nice and, and see-through so you can cure better by using this product. And then the, the principles of this, this technique is really just to make a little hole inside the, the jig and you just squirt flowable composite in there. Um, now, there's a lot of different ways that you do that, and that's also, there's a lot of detail involved in the technique, but the viscosity of the material plays a role, um, the opacity of the material plays a role, so you have to be very specific in the type of flowable material that you use. Um, you can't just use any flowable, and there's specific flowables on the market for that. So if we look at that um, just as a, as a flow, we still need to isolate. And this is also one of the pitfalls that I find in this technique. When I place my rubber dam, I actually I struggle to get this clear jig thing to fit over the teeth. And I have to adjust it and I have to adjust it a couple of times to get it to fit. Um, and when I, when I actually get it to fit, I don't always know if I'm pressing too hard. 
Because remember now, we're trying to build up teeth. So it's, and if, if the holocleusal plane is on a lower level, you don't really have any references. So it becomes really tricky to know how much pressure you need to put on this jig to know where you need to stop. Um, so that's a, a, a quite a, a difficult thing to get right. Um, if you have at least one reference tooth that you know that this is the correct height, that really helps. Um, but yes, you have to adjust this jig quite a bit to make it fit over your, your rubber dam and your clamps. And sometimes you actually have to compromise a bit and, and build up a tooth first, just freehand and try and, and, and replicate the anatomy that you're trying to, to get. Um, then I also use the, uh, the Teflon tape quite, quite a bit here. Yeah. So I prefer using a um, net one, skip one technique here. Yeah. And I only do one tooth at a time. So I would, for instance, do the six and the four together. And then I would do the, I would clean it up. I would polish it. I would work off all the edges, make sure it's a hundred percent. And then I can use those teeth as reference, as reference teeth when I do the seven and the five. Um, but that, those, there are a lot of different techniques in, in, in doing this. Um, I also like using liquid dam when I, when I work with rubber dam, um, but it also sometimes complicates the fit of my jig. So when you go through the process of finding your own, your own treatment, um, way to do this treatment, you will see um, it's not just as easy as, as squirting flowable composite into a, a clear jig. Um, there's also sometimes where you get um, a little air bubbles. Um, now, what the research has shown is that the air bubbles inside is not so, uh, such an issue. Um, so air bubbles inside of composite where it's completely um, covered and, and filled um, around the air bubble is fine. But it, there's, a, there's very little predictability around this, this technique, I find. Um, you still obviously have to light cure. And then the cleanup is the most um is, the, is horrible uh, for, for this um, um when you just get started it, it just it took me most of the time just to do the cleanup and not to actually do the do any any other part of the the technique so it is taking less and less time as you you get more confident in in the um the method but the cleanup is really difficult because everything sticks to everything um, polish and maintenance is quite this, uh, uh, very clear. I mean, that's the same as what we know with normal composites. And I mean, if you look at these, it actually, it, it, it's, it really does. I think the, the actual um, anatomy of the teeth looks really nice. I don't think that there's anything um, wrong with the anatomy that we got here. And if you try and use this technique to build up teeth, um, it really does work and you can get beautiful, beautiful results, but it's going to take you quite some time to get there. I think that this is more applicable for me in the anterior. I've done a couple of cases in the, in the anterior where we also do this injectable molding technique, but the material choice is also an issue here. And it's, you have to think of things like opacity when you're adding material to teeth um, in the anterior region um, and the amount of material that you add. Um, I often use a combination of, in, of, of, of injectable and also just freehand building up of teeth using a jig. Um, as you all know, I mean, these techniques are not new to us. We, don't, we all know how to work with composite. Um, so just in, in summary, the success of this technique, I. I really, of, of these, these indications, indirect composites um, and direct composites, I think they have very specific indications. I don't think that indirect composites can replace everything. I don't think that uh, can replace Emacs specifically. Um, so we have to be very specific in the way that we apply this. It has several advantages. Um, the, the most obvious advantages is cost factor time factors and the, the fact that we can actually replace and repair these, these um, restorations very easy. Know that there is a learning curve and also if you are using an indirect or direct composite in a, as a transitional phase or as an alternative treatment plan in your, to your, for your patients and you are charging them less, very, be very sure that communication is really important. Um, you have to make sure that the expectations are, are met um, I do also think that this is a really exciting new material, specifically talking now about the Tetric CAD material. Um, 
And I think that we'll ha still have a lot of um, research that will be done on this material. Um, just what I did find in the research, which is quite exciting for me, is the use on implants. So um, it's, there's no clear um, um, results yet, but they are, they are sort of hinting that this might be a very nice um, use in temporary implant crowns. Um, because of the modulus of elasticity of, of, these, of the, this material, the modulus of elasticity is very close to dentine. So it's really, it's got like a bouncy effect almost. Um, and there's some, some guys that are doing research on this that's sort of hinting that this might be the perfect spot between strength and also um, getting the modulus of elasticity not too low. So um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing more research done on this, um, but it is, it's still in the beginning area, but I, I think that we are safe to use this um, for the correct indications. Um, and that is, that is it. Thank you very much, Monet. Thanks for sharing some of your art and one of your many success stories. Um, we've got a few questions here, one specifically related to the bite. Um, maybe yes. you can just give a, give a, a tip here and there, um, but I think it, it, it does definitely um, involve a little bit more of a complex explanation to get down to it. So Dr. Mohammed is asking, why open the bite if there is lost tooth structure, then why not simply replace it? By replacing it, the bite would open itself. Yes, I, I think that that is exactly what it is. So if you are replacing tooth structure, we are opening the bite. That, that is what, it's, what it is. So we're not trying to, to, to modify the vertical uh, in, in, in this case that I, that I showed you, before, um, the first case, but we are just trying to replace the tooth structure. But you have to understand that when teeth get worn down, they also over erupt. So if you, do, if you just add material and you're not staying in the limitations of what the occlusion is allowing you, then you can open the bite too much. So if you just add material to, to mimic the anatomy of what the tooth should have looked like, the occlusion doesn't always allow that. So that's why we often have to do orthodontic treatment to get these teeth into a better position so that we can add material. Um, but this is not an occlusal occlusion yes. lecture, guys. No, that's why I said Remember. that we could just give a quick. Um, Dr. Kutsia, Dr. Andre Kutsia is asking, surely the cost save is only on material cost as the dentist has the same amount of work as with Emacs. Uh, I, I see why you would say that, but I disagree. Um, in, in my practice, I do find that it's a lot quicker, purely because of the milling times being so much shorter, and also because I don't have to put this in a furnace. So it is really much shorter. So if you, if you see this even as a one visit dentistry type of um, solution, um, it's, remember, this is 270 megapascals strong. It's really strong. So you can use this for overlays instead of Emacs, and you can do it in one visit if you have your own milling unit. If you're sending it to the lab, then I, I see that they, you, you can say that there's a different difference in cost um, because then you're only saving on the material. Um, but as I said, I, 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 sp I believe that this is specifically if you have, the, the best advantage would be if you have your own milling unit. Okay, and um, some of the delegates are also wondering um, how much cheaper do you actually give this to the patient compared to Emacs? Is it about 50% cheaper or um, yeah. what would you recommend? I charge 50% of what I would charge for an Emacs crown. Okay, and I just want to have a quick look here. There's also just questions on um, cost. And Muhammad is also just wondering um, why won't replacing and fixing add to cost in the long run? Why not do something solid from the start at a little higher cost? But I think you did clearly cover that. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I can elaborate on that point because it is a good point that, that, that he's making. And I think that's something that will be in the back of our minds whenever we treat patients with wear. Um, remember, this is not necessarily the last time you will treat the patient, even if you do it with Emacs. So if you treat a 30-year-old, um, and I think it's very clear to be specific about the indications here. If you have a 30-year-old patient and you treat that patient with Emacs, you will have to replace those Emacs in any case. If you do this with composite, 
we don't yet know how much time we are buying. We know that it's a softer material um, with a better modular elasticity specifically for wear. We can replace them one at a time with Emacs in five years from, um, from now. And that's the way that I see it. I, I think that the less we do now, the better it is for our younger patients specifically. Um, if you have a patient that's, that's older, if you are, it, it, I would not use the same principles. Um, 60, 70, 80 percent, I mean, it's difficult for me to give numbers now, but I probably use Emacs in 70 percent of my cases in any case. So it, this is not for every single case. Um, Mohammed had a few more questions on the occlusion. Um, just, I can't pick up a name here, Galaxy S6 is asking, Enamic is, is not, um, is Enamic not stronger as a hybrid and also molds a lot more easier than Emacs? Um, Enamic is less enamic. If we go back to the slide, I can quickly go back to that slide for us. Um, I don't know how to do that now. Um, but let's just go back to that slide where we actually um, compared all the products. So this is where enamic lies. It's 150 megapascal strong. And it is, it's a hybrid with composite and ceramic. So it's not as strong. It has, it's, it's got a good fracture toughness, but it's also got a higher modulus of elasticity. So it's a good product, but it's, it's also got its own indications. The same with, with Empress. Empress is 185. I love Empress as well. It, it's got its own indications. So you, we should use the products for what it, what it works best. There's no one, one product that works for everything. Almost everything is Emacs, but there, we will always have alternatives. Yeah. I think also with um, Tetricad, you can mill it at a much thinner uh, margin versus something that has got ceramic filler particles in as well, because you always stand a chance of those filler particles being on the edges of your restoration and them actually chipping off. That's right. Yeah. That's one of the biggest benefits is the chipping of the margins and the unevenness of the margins. With composites, we don't get that. We also don't get that with something like Empress. Um, and, and that's why there's different, uh, different advantages of, of using that. Okay. I've got another interesting question here, and this is maybe a fun one. I always ask um, my colleagues as well. So, Mohamed's actually asking is, remind us, what's the flexural strength of a natural tooth? <laughs> it's very close to 300, actually, as far as I know. Um, so, Steph, now do you know? No, I, I mean, it obviously differs from, is it an anterior tooth? Is it a posterior tooth? Mm. Has it got resorption? Has it got a restoration? So there's so many various factors. And um, how is the supporting structures? Is the period patient? So it's yeah. always a question up in the air. Um, yeah, and there's also a, there's a difference between enamel and dentine and, and about how much enamel and dentine we have on, left on the tooth. Yeah, and I think but like it's a good question. Yeah, all our bone structures and muscles are all different from one person to the next. Um, Nadia Abadin um, is asking, could you please comment on the integrity of the composite tooth interface under eccentric bruxing forces, seeing as they have different wear characteristics? Nadia, I'm not quite understanding the question myself. Um, if Corne is not understanding it, maybe you can just put your computer, um, your sound on, unmute yourself, and then you can just elaborate. Unless Corne is reading. Yeah, the I don't. Un <laughs> maybe she's referring to how composite works uh, versus a ceramic in wear patients, in patients that are bruxing. Have we still got her on? Let me just have a quick. Uh... Yes, she's saying yes, Corne. Okay, so um, I, I think that is a quite a, a, a complex question. Um, it's quite a, uh, it, I think it might have a very long answer. Um, I also know that my friend um, Noland is in the audience and he can probably give us even a better answer than what I can. Noland, are you still there? Or have I lost your interest yet already? No, there I'm still go. here. Um, just Will repeat you? the question, please. Um, if Thanks. you open up your chat at the bottom, Nolan, you can also read the question on your side. But Nadia was asking, could you please comment on the integrity of the composite tooth interface under eccentric bruxing forces? Oh, okay. 
So it's very difficult to comment on, on, on this because the research for this is, is quite poor. It's very difficult to have controlled environments to, to study this uh, at an academic level. We can only talk about it anecdotally. anecdotally. Um, and I find that with composites, depending on the fuller particle size, and I suppose I have quite very little experience with tetric CAD, uh, so maybe um, Corne can comment here. But <clears throat> because of the way it's produced or manufactured, that it wears a bit less than a normal composite direct restoration would wear. Um, so you, you, you probably have a little bit more movement and my concern is always at the, the bonding interface because the bonding to dentine is always less predictable than to enamel which is why the advantage of doing the orthodontics and keeping as much in, as enamel as possible is, is, is there. Um, that we'd probably have less um, leakage around the bonding margin with the indirect technique as you would with the direct technique. Um, I don't know if that answers it at all, actually, but yeah, I, I guess my, my, my knowledge on this is not as, as, as thanks, much as- uh, Thanks, Nolan. I think that um, what, she's, yeah. what, she's, what she's also hinting to is, um, I don't know if my mic is Hello? on now. Yes, we can, you. Uh, we can just Okay, sorry. Um, what, what I think what she was also asking about is how different materials would wear and would react in braxing forces. Um, and I, oh, we, we okay. not, right. Yeah. Um, but I, okay. I do think that the modulus of elasticity plays a big role there. Yeah. Um, but we know yeah. that Emax has been proven to, to last very well in braxing patients. So if you want to go with the tried and tested, go with Emax. I think that's, that's the answer. Mm -hmm. So just to, just to come in there a little bit, so if you're looking at the wear against opposing teeth, uh, so you look at the tribulation studies for this, and composite actually doesn't wear opposing teeth um, yeah. as much as Emacs, Emacs would, especially if Emacs is not polished. So the maintenance around indirect restorations is very important. So you've got to constantly ensure that they have polished smooth surfaces. Um, interestingly, uh, not not on what we're talking about today, but zirconia has less wear on opposing yeah. natural teeth than, than Emacs does. Yeah. But that's quite destructive because you have to have lots of um, tooth structure removed. So I would suppose that this tetricad block would also not wear opposing teeth because yeah. it's composite. Yeah, that's definitely the case. For younger yeah. patients, I mean, I think Cornet highlighted this very clearly. And um, for younger patients, this is the ideal treatment. Um, versus looking after your opposing dentition as well. Um, Dr. Christian has asked a question here. Treatment of the restoration is just cleaning with alcohol and applying bonding agents. Is sandblasting absolutely necessary? Yes, Christian, this is a new material. And um, Ibuclaw has actually got the biggest R&D department of all dental companies in the world. So they won't say this if it is not necessary. So what they've tried and tested in the treatment guidelines that they have given. I think us as dentists always try and cut corners and then we try and blame a material for not being um, living up to its expectations. But often it's us that's not using the material according to the rules that is applied. It's like driving a manual car automatically. It's not going to work. Like just drive it the way it's supposed to drive and it will ensure that you're always... Um, yeah, so so what, what I found was that... Um, the failures were all in, in restorations that were not sandblasted. So the, the research is showing that the bond strength is, is affected quite a I mean, it's, it's, it's very significant by the, the, the sandblasting of the restoration. And then when they did see failures, either bond strength or, or um, restorations fracturing, it was much more in the restorations that were not sandblasted. So that is sort of a non-negotiable. Dr. Anita um, asked here about Seltra Dio and the applications and its limitations. Anita, you can just refer back to that company's website and just have a quick look at the applications and limitations. All brochures of all the companies are really nice um, in PDF format, so I'm sure you will come right there. Um, and then we've got another question here from Dr. Andre Kutsia. When you build up more than half of an anterior tooth with a direct procedure, what would the dentist code be for that? Nice, nice practical question. Um, so 
I, I'm very fortunate to work in a practice where, where we, we don't, um, we charge a bit more than medical aid rates. So I, I choose to charge a bit more for these restorations than what uh, the medical aid codes would, would necessarily guide me on. Um, I also truly believe that we should charge for what we're doing. So I, um, you know, just with that in context, um, I don't really want to be guided only by codes. Um, but yes, if you do build up the whole tooth, you can see, you can charge a composite crown. You can also charge a, a composite veneer. It depends on what you're doing, but it is obviously more than just the 8354. Um, you are building up a whole tooth. So, um, but I think that's, that's something personal that you have to um, decide for yourself, what you feel comfortable charging there. Okay, good morning, Priyesh. Um, you asked, what is the cement technique and material of choice for the indirect composite? When Kone is using Tetricad, she's obviously doing an adhesive cementation technique under rubber dam always. And she's using either Verilink Aesthetic Light Cure or Dual Cure. Her favorite is the Light Cure just because you've got more control. So the, the main difference between the Light Cure and the Dual Cure, or the only difference for that matter, is your working time. With a Light Cure cement, you've got a working time of about 12 minutes. So only when you are ready to to harden, you get your curing light out and snap, it's hard. Whereas with a dual cure cement, you've got, you're limited to a working time and then it actually starts hardening while you are working. Um, unless you are specifically asking about the indirect composite for the injection technique, Kone? Um, yeah, I think she's, she is referring to the indirect. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, indirect, definitely light gear, definitely use the same material that you would use. I mean, I like, having the same brand together. So when I use this, I use Ivoclar cement and I use Ivoclar bonding agent. Okay, and Kesson and Priyesh, just I think let's we'll wrap up with those last two questions. What about cementing with heated composite? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, guys that are, that are sort of venturing into that um, at the moment. Um, with this specific uh, material, I think it will work very, very well. Um, Stephanie, if you can maybe comment on the actual limitations due to particle size yeah. and, and why you're still using a looting cement versus a, a heated composite, or is it exactly the same? So maybe your product knowledge there will, will, will be handy for us. Yeah, so the filler particles in a cement is obviously slightly more specialized. Um, yes. Whereas in a composite, you, it's always like a hybrid of something. So there's small ones, there's big ones, and there's minute ones in between. Um, so the technique sensitivity when using heated composite is, is much more advanced than just with using your cement. The cement is, is trying to facilitate you. So you don't have to apply a lot of pressure. The flowability, the slumping, everything is great. When using heated composite from personal experience, you actually apply a lot of pressure. And when you think you're ready to cure, you apply another minute of pressure. And there's always more material expelling around the margin. So when you are using heated composite, just make very, very sure um, that you are using it. Otherwise, once you've cemented, you're actually going to have an occlusal discrepancy. But yes, it is, it's not indicated by Ivoclar, um, but ultimately our resin cement is also resin. It's the same resin that we use when restoring teeth. Um, let's just end off with one last question, Corne. It's really just a practical one. So when you did the immediate dentine sealing on the teeth, you sandblasted the teeth before cementation as well. So do you use the same micron aluminium oxide on both? That's a good question. I actually use less. I, I use a lesser, uh, a smaller particle size um, aluminium oxide. I use the 35 micron um, for that um, because I don't want to do any more um, sort of a rough etching of the tooth surface. I'd, I already have that. It's just for cleaning the surface of the tooth. So I don't use the 50 to 100 and I, I still keep it at 1.5 bar if that answers the question. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much, Corne. Thank you very much for sharing all your valuable knowledge with us. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much for everyone that joined. Um, we will be back Tuesday, same time, same place. Um, I did post my email address in the chat box. It's clinical at ibodine.co.za. Should you guys have any further questions or interest, please pop me an email. I've got a lot of time at home replying emails, so I'll get back to you guys as soon as possible. I hope you all have a lovely day and enjoy lunch. Yeah, thanks, Kone. Thank you. Bye bye.